Um, so today's webinar is led by Kelly Kearsley. Kelly has been a freelance writer and editor for the past 10 years. She started her career as a journalist reporting for daily newspapers. Her work has been published in WSJ.com, Runner's World, CNN Money, and a lot more. Um, she's been writing for a long time. She currently works with some of the world's largest uh, fintech financial services and software companies. So today we're gonna to be talking about why good writing is so imperative, regardless of what you do and what your role is. Um, easy ways to improve your writing for emails and um, reports, stuff like that. And we've, we're all doing so much more emailing now. So that's really great, I'm excited to learn about that. Hopefully you are too. And email best practices to ensure your messages get read. And there's a, just so much more email going on now. Um, so we're really excited to learn. I'm going to end the poll now. I'm just gonna share the results so you guys can see. And I'm gonna bring Kelly on. Hello. Oh, can you hear Hi, me? Hi Kelly, yes. Hello, <laughs> nice to see you. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, of course. Uh, um, yeah, this is really exciting. Uh, fortunately, or maybe unfortunately for everyone out there, talking about writing is probably one of my favorite things to do, uh, maybe even more than actually writing. So uh, I'm happy to be here for the next hour or so. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Oops, I don't need to see me staring here. Okay. Okay, so uh, I've titled this uh, presentation, Writing for Impact, Five Ways to Immediately Improve Your Writing. Uh, it looks like a lot of you uh, deem yourself as average writers. Um, and I think, you know, employ one or two, certainly you don't have to do all five of these tips, but on a regular basis. And I think um, you'll just feel like your writing gets stronger and more clear. Uh, you might even have people comment that you send really great emails. <laughs> Uh, something that uh, I've heard other writers say they get compliments on, so that would be great. Um, you've heard a little bit about my background, but basically I've been writing my whole career in some format. Uh, I also spent about two years teaching journalism at the University of Puget Sound. And currently um, I have taken my journalism skills and I use them to help uh, tech and financial service companies kind of tell journalism like stories. So I do a lot of ghost writing and kind of ghost writing looks like op-ed writing. I do um, all sorts of white papers, articles, blog posting, things like that. Um, a small little blip in my writing career was the time that I got to edit joke submissions for Reader's Digest. Um, I wasn't actually writing those jokes, uh, but I was just reading through stacks and stacks of terrible joke submissions. So um, it taught me a lot about how to edit and how to cut down and how to be a little bit ruthless uh, when examining writing. So uh, not something I did for a career, but pretty fun. Um, so I think that this presentation really is for everyone. I'm going to put a little asterisk. If you're, you know, a professional writer and author, um, you may probably already know this stuff. Even so, uh, it's great to do, great to get these tips and kind of remember to put them into practice. Um, and I think one of the things that kind of breaks my heart when I hear is when people, you know, they kind of put writing into the category of like, you can either do it or you don't, or, oh, I'm not a good writer. Um, writing is just definitely one of those things that um, I really truly believe anyone can be a good writer. Uh, I don't, I think some people are gifted, but the fact of the matter is like, none of us really need to win a Pulitzer right now. We just need to communicate clearly and powerfully with the the people that we want to talk to um and so writing is just something that takes practice i will say that in my own career um when i started as a journalist i wasn't actually i wouldn't have put writing as my strong suit actually i was a much better reporter um i would i would gather all of the information and i would get pretty overwhelmed actually at the writing process and it wasn't until i really instituted actually these five things that I'm going to tell you about that I started to feel really confident in my writing and realized that um, just the kind of having little rules, little processes I follow all the time, um, that I can definitely in take something and improve it no matter what it is. So I'm sure that this is not news um, 
to you guys, but kind of why writing matters really for everyone. Um, I think the, the global pandemic, the fact that we are all working from home right now has definitely increased my email traffic. I think people, if they don't have to be on a Zoom, you know, the, the um, meeting that could have been an email is now more true than ever. And so we're doing a lot of writing. Um, you kind of heard it at the top, but uh, skills are no longer siloed. I'm always really surprised when I'm working with clients um, that I'm not even working with just the marketing department. I'm often interviewing and getting pieces of writing from product managers, from people with more technical backgrounds. Really, everyone does everything, and I just I don't think there's a role right now that doesn't involve some type of writing. Um, specifically for this group, the YPRE group, I think that uh, your professional brand really matters. Um, I think a lot of that comes in how you communicate, you know, via different written platforms, both social media, um, but also um, emails and really any kind of writing you're doing in your job. And so I think it's really important just to um, have it be strong. And finally, um, there's just too much at stake for miscommunication. And I see, I see miscommunications waste a lot of time um, and cause a lot of heartache. So I think striving for clarity is, is always a good goal. Oh, hang on one second. Why is that not letting me go? Here we go. Okay, so these are just some studies I pulled out of HBR. Um, I'm not the only one who thinks people should improve their writing. These are a little bit old, but uh, the bad writing is destroying your company's productivity is, is a great piece just on um, how companies are kind of, of struggling, particularly um, with people kind of the time Austin was able to decipher a lot of this stuff. Um, this person, I won't hire people who use poor grammar. Here's why. Um, that seems a little harsh, but uh, you know, definitely can kind of impact your career. Um, and finally, there's kind of a disconnect. Um, this is from a, a study in 2015. But the vast majority of college graduates really do feel confident in their writing skills. Um, a third of them feel like their recent college grads have great written communication skills. There's a lot of reasons for this disconnect. I strongly believe that the way that you are taught writing in college is actually very different than the type of writing you need to do in the workforce. Um, and so I think some of that disconnect comes with the fact that some of the type of writing we need to do right now is opposite. So today we are gonna learn these five things uh, and then also I add a little section on email. Um, but we're gonna talk about the importance of prioritizing your audience. Uh, we have one, just one grammar tip, uh, what active voice is and why it's the best thing ever. Um, if you take away one thing, make it that. Um, how you can do more showing instead of telling in your writing, uh, why you need a plan, even for small bits of writing, and how to eliminate jargon and sound more human. That's especially important when you're doing business writing. So tip number one here, um, prioritize your audience. Think about it. I mean, any piece of writing you're doing is a piece of communication, and it's also actually a conversation. Um, and so, you know, it's not enjoyable to be in a conversation with someone who is only talking about themselves and kind of uh, not really reading the room. <laughs> um, I think about this a lot, and this is particularly hard. I'll say I work in and with marketing teams all the time. It can be really hard for marketers because there's so much that you want to say about your brand, your product, whatever it is. Um, I think that cuts across everything. That said, um, as you're thinking about your writing, you really want to think about what people need to know. You'll find that like sweet spot in that Venn diagram um, and, and kind of live there. And so, so how do you do that? How do you kind of parse out what, <laughs> what your audience needs to know, whether it's an email reader, whether it's um, your peers, you know, via some summary you need to write, um, whatever it is, even, I mean, I even employ this frankly on social media. Um, ask yourself kind of these things. So think about the questions your readers will ask. Um, this is a good way to actually simplify your writing. Uh, we'll talk about this more in the jargon piece, but you know, think about what do people want to know and, and how can you kind of serve them there. Uh, say the most important thing first. I think I said um, that I feel like maybe college writing sometimes has taught us the wrong way. A lot of us learned how to write in an academic format where we have a big intro and a long buildup to the important thing we want to say. Um, 
in journalism and I think in real life, people don't have that kind of patience. And so, um, you know, leaving the most important thing that you want to say to the, to the end of your email, having these kind of big windups, um, it, it's hard for, for attention to that the whole time. So, so put your important things at the top of your writing. Um, write shorter. Uh, you want to respect people's time. There's a phrase that um, writers use a lot called kill, kill your darlings. When people say kill your babies, um, it sounds super violent, but really what it just means is to, to examine your writing just ruthlessly. Like if you have crafted a phrase and you just love it or you're just fully in love with the paragraph, you know, you have to step back and say, like, do I really need that? Is that actually imperative or is it just there because I love it? Um, oftentimes I, can, I write something and I laugh so hard. I just think that is amazing. And then it's often the thing that I cut because it's more about me than about the audience at that point. Um, and keep it simple. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but you know, keeping things simple, straightforward, simple sentence structures, um, short paragraphs, just kind of, again, respecting the people's time and making it easy for them to get through what you have to say. Okay, this is, uh, this is the grammar tip that I, that I tell everyone. And my big confession is that I thought I knew what this was probably three quarters of the way through journalism school and then realized I did not know what it was. Uh, it was kind of embarrassing. Um, I've never been an awesome grammar person. Uh, if you asked me to diagram a sentence now, I probably could not. Um, but this is something that's really important. It will improve your writing in all sorts of ways. It, it gets to the clarity, it makes things shorter, uh, makes things more powerful. So what is it? It's called active voice. Um, side note, a lot of people think active voice means use action verbs. And so they'll say, oh, I put it in active voice and then they'll have these kind of, you know, like dynamic verbs. Um, that's a very common mistake. It's just, that's not what active voice is. Uh, in the most simplest form, when you're writing, try and structure your sentences, subject, verb, object. So I'll say that one more time, subject, verb, object. It's really how we were taught to write probably when you first learned writing in kindergarten. Um, but it is the best way for so many reasons. So active voice is always direct and clear. There's tons of research looking at active voice that shows that it is the, the best way for readers to understand the message. Uh, the reason for that is that active voice identifies all the important things in a sentence. So it identifies uh, the subject, it identifies object, it identifies what happened, it identifies who did the action. In contrast, passive voice, um, is ambiguous. It, it leaves one of those things out. And in doing so, um, it makes it sometimes hard to discern exactly what you're trying to say. It's really, um, here's an, so here's an example of active voice. My new product solves every problem. You have um, the product and it's solving the problem. So you have the subject, the product, the verb solves the problem, the object. So it works that way. Um, if you were gonna write it in a passive way, um, every problem was solved by my product. Uh, it's just kind of less direct. It's a little squishy. Um, even, even worse, all the problems were solved. Who's solving the problems? What's solving the problems? You don't know. Uh, once you start practicing this, um, you'll, you can start to really pick up when people actually do use passive voice as a tool. You'll notice, for instance, that um, in politics, it's used a lot when people are not wanting to assign blame. Um, you know, they, they leave out the subject. Um, they talk in passive voice. Brands and corporations do this all the time. And I've employed passive voice on purpose, actually, when you're writing for companies and they want to soften a message. So there's a time and a place for it. Um, but the overall effect is that passive voice is less clear and active voice work. So we could come back to that if you have questions on it, but really um, it's great. Also pro tip, um, if you do install Grammarly, even the free version on your computer, in Grammarly will do like an overlay over your, your emails and anything you're writing, um, things in Google Docs, things in Word, it will always identify passive voice sentences. And as soon as you fix them, um, that alert goes away. So uh, you can get really good at, at just switching the order of your sentences around. All right, the third tip is show, 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 and don't tell. Uh, I think the important thing 
again, this kind of goes back to how we were taught to write versus what actually is good writing. Um, people like to use a lot of adjectives and a lot of adverbs in their writing. Um, this is really, really prevalent in resume writing. And it's really, it can kind of seem, it's one of those things that like the package can look good on the outside, but then when you open up, there's, there's not a lot there. Um, and so what show don't tell means is to try and, and sweep out every time you use an adjective, see if instead you can use an example. Um, so instead of saying something's innovative, you know, you know, you can say innovative, but maybe the next sentence you definitely want to say, we've patented the first ever disposable ski goggle cover. That was from a startup that um, I had worked with a little bit. Um, instead of saying your work's high quality, you know, you'd say, uh, I've received, you know, three awards for, for my work, or we've received three national awards for service we provide. Um, you know, instead of saying that you're punctual or always on time, you know, give someone an example. I, I get people asking me to correct their resume or uh, review and improve their resumes a lot. And this is probably the very first thing I do is I look for how they're talking about their self, themselves and I look for how they're showing me and where they're, what they're not telling. And I mean, any time that you can just say, here's how I did what I did, even if it's a short sentence, um, it's that much more powerful. People remember that you delivered a port three days ahead of time and 20% less cost than projected um, versus just saying you're an on-time person. So, so focus, on, focus on the showing and um, not the telling. Okay. So four, have a plan. Um, I feel like this can sometimes make me sound a little anal. Uh, I'm actually not as organized of a person as I would want to be. But uh, when it comes to writing, I'm, I'm really, really organized. And I think when I was telling you at the beginning that when I was, when I was a journalist and I found myself being kind of overwhelmed, um, I used to do a lot of investigations and I just have reams and reams of information. I wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, probably the biggest thing that helped me was having a plan. And so writing with a purpose um, and kind of understanding where you want to go and the ingredients you'll need before you even start is just huge. It, it alleviates a lot of the anxiety around writing of kind of staring at that blank screen. And it almost turns your writing, it makes your writing a little bit templated, which I think is, is perfectly fine. Um, and so, so yeah, you wanna write with a purpose. Again, you do wanna put everything important up top. Um, and look for a mechanism that kind of helps you organize your thoughts. I had an editor tell me this, uh, I think when I was in my 20s. I use this for email writing all the time. Uh, it's what, so what, now what. Uh, I think that is a beautifully simple way to structure 90% of what you want to say and write to someone. Um, you know, the first sentence or the first paragraph can be what? Uh, the second is essentially the why I'm telling you this or what's what's the reason for it being important. And the third bit is what comes next. Um, I used to have that on a sticky note taped to my computer um, and I would look at it all the time. But, you know, coming into things organized, I I actually almost for most emails will, will bullet out what I want to say um, before I do any real writing and then I'll hop back in. And that might be something that takes me you know, a minute, two minutes, and then I'll go back in and fill it back in, and that's another couple minutes. Um, but I find that when I have a plan for my writing, it's all—it's just always better. Uh, something that that people don't like to do, it maybe seems like it's adding a step. It's—it's it's actually really saving you time. Oh, this is my <laughs> this is my favorite example of uh, an email without a plan, and of why it's so deeply important to put. Uh, the most important information first. So this is an email from an executive at no, uh, Nokia, the, the cell phone company. Um, and you can see the, the sentence that I highlighted in red says, um, you know, it's, you know, I think maybe a, a dozen paragraphs in. And it says, we plan this would result in an estimated reduction of 12,500 factory directed professional employees over the next year. So that's obviously the big takeaway from this email. Um, it's definitely a case of, of burying the lead. 
And I would anticipate that a lot of people who initially read this email didn't even get that far. Maybe that's on purpose, but I don't think that's very effective communication. So a great case for both having a plan for what you're writing and then putting the most important things at the top so your readers don't, don't miss it. Kind of speeding through this, um, we're at 25 minutes, that's all right. So doing away with jargon. Uh, this is particularly, this is really hard to do in, in a corporate context. Um, I, I have like a, a soft spot in my heart for jargon. I, li I like new words and I get kind of um, addicted to certain phrases. Uh, in fact, I see on this one, I, I was using the word future proof for, for quite a while in a lot of different client pieces. Um, but the trouble with jargon is that it's often not really what you mean. It's, it's often kind of used for, for various purposes and none of those purposes are, are clear communication. So it's often filler. Um, the meanings can be fuzzy. It's used to make people sound smart um, or to kind of fit in with um, what everyone else is saying. But when you really break down the words, uh, they don't really mean that much. Um, and I think that's why a lot of corporate communication can be a little confusing because when you kind of remove the decorative jargon packaging, um, what's inside is, is less clear. So I think like a great challenge for anyone is to look at anything you're putting together, um, identify kind of the buzzwords and they change every year. Um, I think, you know, last year, everyone that I was working with wanted to talk about um, leveraging things and pivoting and digital transformation. Uh, I remember being on a, a call and I think, um, uh, someone who worked at investment banking said the phrase over my skis. And then I, I you know, we don't want to get over our skis. And then I proceeded to hear over my skis, uh, maybe on like calls for the next six months, like it just kind of took off. Um, but, you know, kind of keep your ears peeled for, for things that sound like buzzwords and then see if you can't just replace them with real words. You know, um, I've, I've started axing leverage out of my writing and instead I just use the word use. Um, you know, it, it makes things more clear. Um, you want to kind of pretend you're translating your jargon for someone who's not in your industry and you want to explain things simply even for people who are in your industry. Sometimes people kind of ask, uh, oh like do you have to write at a, a fifth grade level or a third grade level or a 12th, you know, and I think that's a silly question. Right? Uh, it's not about things, wrong, but it is always about being clear. And things that are really quite smart. Uh, I do a lot of work um, consulting firms, and one partner there told me that when he's explaining things, he likes to think of himself as explaining something to an intelligent Martian. He's like, so someone who is not of this world, they're not of this place, but they're a smart person. I think that's an excellent way to, to both kind of think about your writing, but also kind of to view your use of jargon. Um, if someone doesn't, wouldn't understand what a phrase meant, you just cut it out and replace it with, with a phrase that they would understand. Your writing becomes stronger as a result. Um, and people probably can't put their finger on why, but it would be, that would be why. If you get the chance and you are kind of interested in um, corporate speak, uh, this article from Vulture is kind of a long read. I think it um, maybe took me 10 minutes. So um, it's great, it's called Garbage Language and uh, it just really gets into the psyche of buzzwords and it's definitely worth devoting a little time to. Um, okay, so for the last little bit here, I'm hoping we can talk about emails. Uh, I, I, I heard that there were some, some ideas for emails and people had questions. Um, this tweet just made me laugh. Uh, I think I've made errors in emails that have definitely kept me up at night and I really identified with this person. Um, so, so tips for, first off, I kind of want to back up. Uh, those tips that I just relayed totally work for email. I think they work for anything. Um, you know, you want to be an active voice. You want to keep things short and concise. Um, you want to 
ax out that jargon and have a plan that stuff is great for emails. There are some things that I think are specific for emails. Um, I've kind of pulled these together from my own experience. I, I have done some email um, marketing, so I try to apply that a little bit to, to how I send emails and uh, my, myself personally and professionally, um, and kind of tips from, from the broader, uh, broader experts in writing. Um, so I think the very first thing you can do for writing better emails, this is actually, it might just be me trying to eliminate a pet peeve here, but let's just put those subject lines to work. Um, I, I just think lazy subject lines are a problem for everyone. There is nothing worse than getting an email, seeing the subject line, and it does not designate what the email is about or the action that is needed. Um, and I think it, it delays people getting responses to you, frankly. People don't necessarily understand what you need and those can just get lost in the fray. So, um, you, you know, we don't need lazy subject lines. We want to, we want to put them to work. Um, we don't need things that say like, hi, or we're just like responding to forwards. Um, and it's kind of stacking up. Um, I try to make my subject lines really specific. They're not long. Um, and I do actually challenge you to keep myself pretty short, you know, but I'll say something like two questions about your, about your report or, you know, I need feedback on this in the subject line. Um, and I find that people get back to me a lot quicker when I'm really specific about, about what I need up front. In a similar vein, and maybe like the theme of this presentation, um, don't bury your message or your main points. So um, you wanna put important things first. I have spent a lot of time kind of scrolling through, particularly um, emails from clients and kind of you know big long group emails where I'm just, looking for what the what is and I'll and I'll see in an email that there's like a question in one paragraph and a request for something two paragraphs down and a whole bunch of assets and information um, and it's all just too much so you know you want to um, put important things up top and I like to employ this little writing tool which is essentially called giving your reader a heads up about what's coming if I do need to send a bit of a long email the very first thing I'll say is, hey, I have two questions and one request for you. Let's start with the questions. Um, I'll let them know what's coming so that they know the purpose of the email. And they also know like what they're looking for in the body of that copy. Um, in journalism, we talk a lot about kind of making things easy on the reader. And I think this is, this is in service to that for sure. We want to keep things easy for people. Um, same here, writing short and tight uh, is really hard to, to pour over really long bodies of copy. Um, I don't love it, I don't think anyone does. I, sometimes I'll open up a long email on my phone and kind of like find myself uh, wanting to close it before I get done. So a couple ways to kind of get around this and to kind of ensure your emails get read. Keep your paragraphs really short. Uh, the line breaks and I can be uh, one sentence long, they can be sentences long, max they should be three sentences. If you cannot convey kind of everything about a topic in three sentences, you might need to have a phone conversation. Um, next, uh, really lean on like bullets and kind of other organizing functions within your email to just make it really scannable for people. So a lot of the content I'm creating for clients is um, uh, long form, long form content that, um, you know, they'll use as like a, a big piece of sales collateral. So I'll do a lot of like ebooks and white papers. And my whole goal when I'm writing something that's super long, maybe it is 2000 words, maybe it's 5000 words, is I never want the reader to feel like they read something that was 2000 words or 5000 words. I want them to feel like they just breezed through and they can't believe that they read it that fast. Um, I think the same can apply when you're writing emails. So, so use those bullets, give people a heads up. Um, if you find it yourself writing an email and you are four or five paragraphs in, you know, shorten it up and actually have, have a phone conversation if you can, or as you know, a Zoom meeting, um, kind of help people out there. Uh, and lastly, on the emails, <clears throat> I would say, um, you know, remember, it's easy to kind of treat email as like a, a casual conversation. 
Um, but you do want to use it, particularly earlier in your career. I mean, you you want your emails to reflect well on you as a professional, um, as someone who who does high quality work. Um, and so, you know, some some easy wins that we're all guilty of not doing, and that would save a lot of anxiety. Like the tweet a minute ago, people up at night thinking about a typo. Just proof your emails mistakes get people's names right take that extra minute after you write something and give it give it a look um, I have a couple tools I use for this um, I'm a big fan if you haven't enabled the recall function um, in your Gmail uh, to correct mistakes post send I just maybe like get off this call and do it right now that has saved my bacon so many times you just want to um, you know it lets you it gives you about I think 30 seconds to undo an email that you've sent Sometimes I just, you know, almost like click it in like an OCD way because I just want to make sure that everything looks great in it. But um, but enabling that can kind of save you on the back end if you do see a typo after the fact. Uh, I think I mentioned this before, but you know, using some sort of AI editor or Grammarly, um, most of them are for free if you don't pay for the premium version. Um, when you install it as an overlay, it will correct your emails or send you alerts about your emails for you. So that's kind of invaluable and I've found kind of makes it easy to make sure that everything I'm sending out is buttoned up and looks professional. Okay, so your last um, kind of tips here, just some, some tools and resources. I mentioned Grammarly, um, but oh, <laughs> if you do find yourself like, oh, I wanna learn more about grammar, but I don't, you know, love grammar, um, then go ahead and uh, look up the oatmeal. I don't know if you've ever looked up that cartoonist, but he has a huge number of comics about grammar. He actually has a great one about the difference between active and passive voice. And I would say they make some grammar conventions so much easier to understand, plus they're hilarious. Um, I just read this book, uh, I think I read it over the holidays, Writing to Persuade. Ooh, it's right here. Ta -da. Um, it's by Trish Hall, and she was the former editor of the New York Times op-ed page. I feel like that should be just required reading for, for every person. Um, whether, you, you know, you don't need to be writing New York Times op-eds, but she talks about just the best ways to convince, use writing to convince people. And uh, a lot of it is actually reflects some of what I just told you. Um, but there are really, really good tips in there. And if, you, if, you, if you're in any sort of marketing, um, or sales position, uh, that book is a, is a great thing. And then me, uh, I am happy to help people with writing questions. Uh, I often get asked to put eyeballs on different pieces of writing and I do that a lot. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out. Um, oh, here's my little guy. He's not, that's not my baby, he's just a meme. <laughs> but I do think, like I said, um, you do not have to be a professional writer to be a good writer. You can, um, put some of these tips to use and definitely, I would say, see a, a significant improvement in the work you're putting out to. So I will stop there and pick up questions. Let's see. Okay, so this is from Anonymous. It says, love this tip. I'm not sure which one it was, but what do you think about folks bolding and changing color to emphasize their point? Um, <clears throat> I'm not a giant fan of, of colors in emails. I think that's just a personal preference. I don't know. Um, I do use bolding a lot. I, I actually sometimes will put my emails into formats that probably look a little bit like a blog post. So I'll I'll use that kind of intro sentence to say what's coming. I'll add some bullet points. There'll be like a bolded header right there, uh, bullet points, another bolded header. So I think whatever works for you, as long as it's definitely um, adding to the, to the clarity and kind of in service to the reader. Um, okay, oh. Are there particular online writing and grammar courses that I recommend? Uh, well, I just noted that Oatmeal Comics are both hilarious and, and actually exceptionally good teachers of different grammatical conventions. So if you just Google the oatmeal, click on the grammar, um, they're great. Uh, 
I also used to follow Grammar Girl a lot and listen to her podcasts. Um, I have read uh, Eats, Shoots, and Leaves, which is just a tiny little grammar book. That is another fun way to kind of absorb some um, absorb some grammar tips. Um, and I also uh, keep a copy of the Elements of Style, which is kind of a, a style guide that maybe a lot of us picked up in college, and I'll refer to it sometimes. I will say, um, I don't think that grammar is most people's biggest problem. I think all of us are pretty, I mean, all of us are pretty, pretty solid on grammar. Um, and in fact, you know, one of the things about grammar is that once you really know how to use grammar, then you just break grammar rules left and right on purpose. So, so it's, it's probably more art than science. And I think just um, understanding some of the basics really well is really helpful. Okay, let's see. <laughs> uh, let's, so this question says, do you think grammar today has become less important with all the slang and jargon out there? Uh, I'm not saying it's important. I'm just curious, has it changed the, the more technical world? Um, I, I don't know if slang and jargon have impacted grammar so much, um, but I do think that uh, it's given people permission to just kind of change how they use words that are, is not always in the best interest of our audiences. I mean, one thing that I notice all the time and, and I both find comical and also alarming is like making words into verbs that aren't verbs. That is really, really common in the tech world. Um, you know that they they kind of change. Suddenly something becomes a verb and it's not. Uh, and I think it makes people <laughs> maybe feel like they sound cool. Uh, I don't think it's the best for, for audiences. So I would say grammar in general is all right. Um, but, uh, but changing, you know, altering verbs is, is where I, I come down. Um, Stephanie says, what word count do you recommend for a blog? That's a really good question. The recommendations for blogs have just really changed over the past couple of years. Um, it used to be maybe around five, 600 words is a pretty solid blog post. Uh, now I think with the way a lot of the search algorithm algorithms work, a lot of my clients are moving towards what I would call much longer articles, anything like above a thousand words. Um, that said, I think that there are very few topics that merit much more than six or 700 words. So, um, if you have a very defined topic and something to say about it and you can't say it in 700 words, then chances, chances are you're probably rambling on. So I, that's my sweet spot. I try not to write too much over 700 words when I'm doing blogs. Um, if it is something long and big and complex, uh, a white paper ebook that might range into past a thousand, but but blogs can be much shorter. Oh, can you give some details of when to use a comma versus when to use a semicolon? Um, I can. Oh, I wish I had a, I wish I had a board here. Um, yes. So one, I'll tell you, I come from the school of. Uh, the AP School of Writing I actually worked for the Associated Press for a while. And they're just, I think people will get in fights on the street about um, serial commas and if you should use them. And a serial comma is when you have three things in a row and you say, um, you know, I like writing chocolate and puppies. And you would put a comma after chocolate and before the and. Um, the AP always said, never ever do that. Um, everyone else in the world was like, please use that comma. And, um, you know, people, tears were shed over this issue. I've had many a copy editor yell at me about it. Um, I think that most commas are unnecessary. And I might be, uh, have an unpopular opinion here. Um, but, you know, you want to use a comma when it makes sense to separate, separate a thought. Um, and when it adds clarity to the sentence that wouldn't be there otherwise, which is why I actually do use a serial or Oxford comma now, um, because I think separating that last listed item from the next part of the sentence can be very helpful. Um, a semicolon, I like semicolons. I kind of like throw them in there to spice things up. I, they're kind of, 
it's funny the word croutons came to me. they're like croutons in your salad um i don't think they're necessarily necessary usually when you have a semicolon you could just have a period so semicolons are best used to separate uh two related but fully separate thoughts um you could put them in to kind of shake up the flow of your writing um but you could also probably use a period so that's probably comma versus semicolon um, if you could put a period at the end of the phrase and it is a complete sentence, you can use a semicolon. How do you feel about using emojis uh, and memes in emails? Um, well, so I am like on the very bottom end of Gen X and, and that might color my, my thinking. Um, I, I don't use emojis in emails very often. Um, in business emails every once in a while. Uh, Stephanie actually posted something on Facebook asking about exclamation points too. And um, I would say use both with caution and thought. So emojis, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that emails need to, to be filled with emotion. And I don't think that we need to let people know we're smiling or laughing or LOL necessarily in a business context. Personal, go for it, do whatever you want. Um, if there's an appropriate meme that'll make your peers laugh or, or something, then go ahead and use it. But overall, um, I kind of like the writing to speak for itself. On the subject of exclamation points, kind of same vein, uh, there is a funny, um, there's like a funny trend right now of people relying on exclamation points to, um, to, to like soften their message and let people know that they're saying something that they're not like, it's probably taking the place of an emoji, right? That they don't have like a stern face that they're like, hi, not like, hi. Um, I think that it's particularly prevalent among women that, I, that we feel like we need to be less direct in our messaging and instead just use exclamation points to soften things up. So when I write, um, when I write in a professional setting, I actually, after I send, before I send an email, I go back through and I look for two things. I try to eliminate exclamation points unless I'm writing to people who I really love and often I'll say, hi, exclamation point, or hello, exclamation point. But within the body of the copy, no, we don't need it. Uh, two, I always go through and I eliminate the word just. Um, this is another weird kind of crux that a lot of us have. Uh, we put in the word just to soften, soften our messaging. And it is really unnecessary. And when you pull it out, it actually makes your sentences stronger. So I am a fan of just using periods and question marks. Um, you really get all stuff that's on your language. You can be more direct. You don't need to, we don't need to be so soft. Being direct is, is appreciated. Uh, what about capitalizing in titles, every word or no? Um, that is just really all about, um, all about the style of, of the company, the brand, the publication that you're writing for. Some people love title case, which is when you're capitalizing the top of an article or a blog, you capitalize every Some people have sentence case, you just capitalize the first. Um, trend wise, sentence case is more in right now, so not capitalizing. Um, if you wanna <laughs> if you wanna talk about capitalization trends, hit me up. So, scintillating conversation, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'm more of a fan of sentence case. So. Okay, is it okay? So let's see, Garrett asks, is it okay to include like third or uh, TH or ST when writing a date such as April 3rd? Um, I think so. I do a lot. I'm a big fan of, of writing a bit how we speak. Uh, I think that is like a comfortable way to um, to write and so it's easy for people to to read that and go April 3rd, I get it. So yeah, I would stick with that. Um, and then, oh, hi, Aaron Riley. Um, Aaron wants to know about <laughs> the startup Ben blog. So I used to write the startup Ben blog and then kind of did that for about six years and decided to maybe move on to other writing projects. And Aaron wants to know if you have another outlet for us to enjoy your writing. Not quite yet, but I am working on a couple projects that I'm excited about. So I'll let you know when they come to fruition. Um, and let me see, I see something in the chats here. Oh, no. Okay, so 
with just about 10 minutes to go, we answered a lot of writing questions. Um, we talked a lot about grammar. If anyone else has any other questions, send them now. Um, but I think probably the last thing I just wanna, wanna leave you with is something that I tell my clients all the time, which is to not be so scared of your writing. Um, you know, writing isn't, we, I mean, the great news is we're not carving any of this stuff in stone. So when you're writing something, and I don't care if it's like an email to a, an employer prospect, maybe a job you want, if it's your resume, if it's your cover letter, and you feel kind of an inkling to try something new, just try it. And then you can always go back to what you had before. Um, I think that people can feel very like um, stressed about their writing. And you should just kind of approach it with a bit more joy. I mean, this is, we are just communicating after all. We're talking to people we work with. We're talking to our friends. Um, and so, you know, don't be afraid to try new things, to change it up, to make a mistake every now and then, knowing that you can uh, always get better. So with that, I will wrap it up and send it back to Addie. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was great. I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, I certainly took a lot of notes. <laughs> ah! <laughs> <laughs> but we will also be sending out um, her PowerPoint afterwards. It has the links in it and all of that. Um, if there are any more questions, go ahead and pop them in. We do have a couple more minutes, which is great. We finished a little bit early. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Aaron sent me a question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I'd love to answer. Am I on mute? Nope. I'm talking still. Um, Aaron says, what's your favorite thing you've written and why? Um, I write a, I mostly write for other companies. And so I don't write from a first person point of view. And, and actually I would say like two things, the, the body of work that was the startup Ben blog was one of the favorite things I've ever written because I did do a lot of that writing in first person. Um, I gave myself when I started that project, I thought like, Oh, you don't put a lot of your own personality into your writing. Um, and so this would be a chance to do it since, you know, kind of just, doing this for yourself and for the community and for fun. So I enjoyed writing some of those. And I, um, you guys could probably tell, I, I like, if you read it, I, I put in jokes and, and was silly a lot. <laughs> um, another thing that I, I loved writing, I took a personal essay class with the intent of trying to get a personal essay published into a national magazine. And I ended up writing a, an essay about, <laughs> about how I used to try uh, to intentionally get uh, male runners into races while I was out on my regular afternoon jogs and um, I turned it into an essay and sent it to Runners World and they published it so that was really fun let's see um, <laughs> why oh <laughs> people are now sending me grammar jokes <laughs> why should you never date an apostrophe they're too possessive you guys I love a good grammar joke. I'm sorry, I'm it's the right audience here. Let's see. <laughs> okay, Hattie, I don't see any other any other question. Oh, do you have any advice on how to write a good press release? Um, I do. Here's what I do when I write press releases. Um, let's see how to say this right. A lot of people want to write press releases, and and if you remember the first tip I said, prioritize your audience. Uh, and when you're writing a press release, it's very easy to prioritize yourself because you have a lot of news that you want to tell someone and it's usually for good reason. Um, don't do that. Uh, remember who your audience is. And in this case, it's journalists. And so they want to know the best story and they want you to tell it to them quickly and kind of efficiently. And so um, writing when you when I write press releases, I write them how I would envision the news story to be written in the publication that I am pitching. Uh, and I've had great luck with press releases just being kind of published as is by doing that. Um, what that means is, and where it can be hard is if you're working for a company, that press release may not include all of the corporate speak and, um, you know, kind of extra things that lots of times marketing teams want to put in, but you have to fight back a little bit. Um, in terms of how to write a good, pre like resources for writing a good press release, I don't know if I have like any 
press release specific, but I think anything about good journalism would would help. So structuring it in kind of an inverted paramount format, which is the most important thing on top, and then kind of descending order, um, things like that is important. Oh, and always always have a great first sentence. People always want to have press releases. They say, oh, today Kelly Kersley announced she was going to host a writing seminar. Like that is, you know, I like fell asleep while I was even trying to say that. So you want to um, get a punchy sentence that just like sparks a little curiosity from the news second. Okay, I have one question for you. Okay. Um, what do you okay. do when you get writer's block or if you're feeling really stuck about how to make something punchy or exciting? Yeah, um, I do. I do a lot of things. So I find that because I segment my writing into different steps. So like we said that the tip I gave about having a plan, um, I never force myself to sit down and stare at a blank screen and be like, what should the first sentence of this long thing be? Because I just I really hate that feeling. I think I have PTSD from like writing really long journalism stories and doing that. Um, so what I do is I sit down at a screen. And I think, what do I know needs to be included right now? And then I start with that and I give myself the freedom to understand that that might not even be the first thing. It might be in the middle of the story or the article or the piece, it might be at the bottom, um, but that's okay. I just kind of start putting things down on paper. Then after I put things down or, you know, on screen, after I put them down, then I organize them into like the right order. And then when it comes to actually like, do the writing, I feel like I've achieved about 75% of the work, which is, I know what I want to include. I know how I want to organize. Now I just got to put the words to it. And then I kind of have fun. Like, oh, oh, this is like, I can spend some time working with, um, working with the words. So that's the professional way I do it. The like secret way I do it is sometimes I'll just have a glass of wine and then see what happens. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I've written many a hilarious website copy with one glass of wine and just deciding not to be so serious about it. So that's my favorite. Do. That's my favorite tip from today. <laughs> <laughs> when all else fails, a I glass of wine. Zero. I thought, would I tell my clients that? Probably not. That there's been some white papers written with a little bit of rosé. You heard it here first, everyone. <laughs> you got the inside scoop. <laughs> it was helpful. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being here, Kelly. We really appreciate it. Um, I know that everyone was really excited for today and I, it sounds like you answered a lot of questions um, even in your presentation since we didn't have a ton of questions floating at the end. So I really appreciate it. Um, nice. Really great information. Um, okay, well, just to wrap this up, thank you everyone for attending. We do have tomorrow, the chamber is putting on um, our fourth in the impact series so if you uh if you want to attend make sure you get signed up you can sign up on the chamber website on the yp website or on either of our facebooks um tomorrow is going to be uh the um sorry the title is uh workforce management during a pandemic so we've got some great local leaders who are going to come on and talk about how they've been reacting with um, their employees and things like that what they've been doing and then we have the tech challenges of working from home and how to fix them coming up as well next week. Um, so make sure that you get signed up for that. You can get signed up on the website, the YP website. Thanks again for today, Kelly. All right. Yeah, of course, thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye everyone, thank you for attending. <laughs> Bye.